our church really has a vision to reach thousands locally and millions globally I remember when we were praying for 1040 window like every Sunday every Friday it dawned on me this week in the last two weeks I preached at the conference that reaches 1040 window so two weeks ago I did a crusade on a shine star TV that reaches potential 200 million people in 79 countries which are in 1040 window out of that 2440 people called the station in one hour to receive Jesus Christ come on let's give the Lord clap offering we prayed for that this Wednesday after our men's Bible study I rushed to church we had a prayer of fasting during that time I was also doing another crusade for about 40 minutes in King television that reached 182 countries with potential 241 million people and mainly in 1040 window during an hour 19,000 prayer requests were submitted and 400 people gave their life to Christ come on church thousands locally and millions globally I truly believe that that is our not only vision and our dream but honestly that is where the Lord is opening doors for us to minister amen to God be the glory for what he is doing through our ministry and through each one of us those of you watching us online as well you know you're a part of that I would like to ask you to do something right now could you pull out your phone for a second and go on your Facebook if you have one could you share the broadcast those of you who are watching us online you're part of our extended family whether you're in Tri Cities watching right now and maybe you still don't feel comfortable coming we understand that want to let you know the distance is not a barrier God is as powerful here as he is in your living room in in your sitting room in your office or in your room just click on the share broadcast on your Facebook where you are watching or on your YouTube share it on Twitter on Facebook let other people know that they can be part of the church from the comfort of their home so as we do that we will come to a time right now of a message today is a special Sunday service it's a breakthrough Sunday every few months or so we do a special service where we pray for finances we talk about the area of giving we talk about the area of work and we talk about the area of our life that takes a lot of time I understand that the idea of money and the pastor talking about it can give some people a heartburn but we must understand that Jesus there are 2350 verses in the Bible on money it's twice as much as on prayer and faith combined 15 percent of everything Jesus taught was about money it's more than hell and heaven combined one third of his parables dealt with money 16 out of 38 of his parables dealt with money one out of seven verses in three gospels dealt with finances the only subject Jesus talked more than money was the kingdom of God now throughout the week we work eight hours a day it's about money it's about work and it's an important part of our life and people who would come to church and say I don't want to hear about it why are we talking about praying for people to have homes see if you grew up in a family where before you even turned 20 and your parents handed you a keys you might not understand but there are people in this room today that for them to have a home it's a breakthrough for you to have a home maybe it's just natural you, you were like it's a piece of cake I don't even need to pray for it but you do have other areas in your life where you're believing for a breakthrough that for them things come easily never judge somebody for what it takes faith for them like Abraham it took faith for him to have children but it didn't take faith for him to have money Abraham was rich like this Hagar on the other hand did not need faith to get pregnant she got pregnant from the first time but well, she didn't have a husband each one of us has an area of our life where we need faith each one of us has an area of our life we need a breakthrough from God for some of us your children are doing great but you're struggling with your business and there's others your business is doing great you'll give all the money just so your children will serve God every one of us needs God and God will never bless you to that degree that will make him unnecessary in your life come on somebody and so when it comes to work when it comes to finances when it comes to our ministry when it comes to our business when it comes to our side hustle I believe that God wants us to be involved in it and we as Christians do everything that we do as unto the glory of God amen it's not about money it's about our heart and someone says that your checkbook is a greatest indicator of your theological preferences 
If you want to see what you worship, see where the money goes. Amen. Amen. Today I want to look at a few things when it comes to not only giving, but also when it comes to uh, us being stewards. In the beginning of the year, I felt strongly not to do a special sacrifice Sunday. I really saw that our church is in a moment where a lot of people are building. And to not lead our church to a special sacrifice Sunday, but to encourage people in our church to save and invest. This came as a shock to some people because typically from a pastor, you know, you would expect pastor, you know, always wants to encourage people toward giving, but we have to be led by the Lord. And we understand that our church is a generous church and there's a time to sow and there's a time to reap. And I really felt that this would be the year where a lot of people will be building, a lot of people will be starting businesses. And so when we led the church into that and we're seeing today many young families for the first time are moving into their homes or about to move into their home. You know, the interesting part that during even this pandemic, though we didn't have physical meetings, our giving didn't drop. People continue to give because our people are faithful to God. And God is rewarding, God is blessing our young families and I'm happy for that. I don't have a problem with prosperity. The only problem I have with prosperity is when the pastor is the only one prospering. People don't have a problem with prosperity either. But if the only guy who's talking about it is the only guy who's prospering and everybody else is poor, that's the problem. And so our goal is that the life of our church is growing. Because when God blesses our church, they become generous, they serve others, they open their homes for life groups, they open their homes for adoptions, they open, they have children who grow up to be faithful citizens and contributors to their society. And so our desire is that our church people prosper. They live generous and they prosper. Prosperity is very different for people watching in India and those watching in Dubai. Definition of prosperity is different for some of you who own a multi-millionaire business and for some of you who just have an eight to five job. But each one of us understand prosperity is when you have more than enough to pay for your bills, help others, take a vacation once a year and live without financial stress. Amen. Amen. We're going to read two verses, uh, two portions of the Bible. First from the New Testament and second one from the Old Testament. The New Testament, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart. Somebody say purposes in his heart. Let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or out of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver and God is able to make all all grace abound toward you that you having all sufficiency in all things may have abundance for every good work that's new testament look what a lot of alls there all grace all sufficiency not barely enough god is el shaddai not god i'll get by mm -hmm all sufficiency meaning it's it's sufficient it's enough all sufficiency in all things all things and then he says have abundance for every good work not few works not just my work but not my wife's work not just my wife's work but not my children's work every good work come on somebody let's go to the new testament to the old testament in daniel daniel chapter one we will contrast two verses Daniel chapter 1 and verse 8 it says the following but Daniel purposed in his heart that he will not defile himself with a portion of king's delicacies and I'm gonna skip and read verse 9 now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of eunuchs and then verse 10 we will read just a little bit later there is three reasons why people give according to Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7 people give grudgingly I call that pressure people give out of necessity that's prompting and third one is they give because they purpose in their heart to give pressure I remember first time and the only time I gave out of pressure uh, this uh, ministry that I sold to in the other country they called back after I visited that country but I said I'm hearing a little bit too much echo over here. 
um, I came home and they called me and they said God told us for you to give us money each month a thousand dollars and I was like well thanks I hang up the Skype and I was like the devil is a liar I ain't giving nothing to nobody I was like spirit of manipulation witchcraft out and next morning I went in to pray and those thoughts kept coming back to my mind and I said God you gotta be kidding me this can't be you you don't operate like that and I really felt that I need to do that and so I became a partner of that ministry for two years then I switched partnership to another ministry and last year I became a partner of Hungry Gen but it was somebody's pressure that actually became something that changed my life for those of you who are like no God will never use pressure explain to me why prophet Elijah came to Awero he pressured her <laughs> to give him the last meal it was pressure God told Elijah that I told the widow to feed you. Elijah showed up. The widow never got the memo. Because when Elijah said, do you have any to eat? The widow looks at him and says, excuse me? Who are you? Who are you? The, wi the widow never heard from God. So Elijah has to honestly pressure her. And she gave. It saved her life. The rich ruler who came to Jesus and the scripture says that he boasted about the Ten Commandments that he kept. And then Jesus honestly threw him under the bus publicly. He put a really unhealthy pressure and said if you really want to be perfect sell everything you have so even Jesus created I'm not saying that this is the only way but sometimes pressure is good you're driving on the road and you see a homeless person with a sign God didn't speak to you you felt pressure and guess what you did you acted out of generosity and that's not bad you will not be punished by God for being generous even under pressure but that is not how God and why God wants us to give. The second reason for giving is prompting. It's honestly necessity. It's when you feel a strong prompting in your heart to give. Strong conviction. We say like this, God puts on your heart to give. God puts on your heart to give. You come to church and you feel led to give. And that's good. But the third I believe is the best way it's when God doesn't put on your heart you decide in your heart look what the Bible says Paul says you purposed in your heart he didn't say God put it there you decided to give you may say how and why would God do that God doesn't have to put things on your heart because he already put a new heart inside of you that can make right decisions Come on somebody. No parent will be upset if their children do chores without being told. No mom and dad would wake up in the morning and be outrageous. Why? I can't believe you cleaned the car, cleaned the garage, washed the dishes, made up your bed and I haven't screamed at you, pushed you or like yelled at you and you did it on your own. No, every parent will understand finally kids grow up <laughs> some people come to church and they say God didn't tell me to give he's expecting you to grow up the spirit didn't move me to tithe you know Vlad I don't feel led to fast with you guys on Wednesday it's not because you graduated from the life of fasting it's because you graduated from maturity and God is waiting for you to grow because only grown-up adults in the house don't need to be constantly told to pick this up wash the dishes clean after yourself could you make up your bed could you please honey brush your teeth could you put the shoelaces tie the shoelaces why because when you grow you can make those decisions on your own and it makes you have parents happy God loves cheerful giver meaning a giver who doesn't need to be prompted or pressured they honestly they do it because they know it's the right thing to do they know there is nothing wrong with being generous and it makes their father happy God says I love grown-up children if you're taking notes write this down you don't need a prompting to give give as you purpose in your heart God doesn't put things on our heart since he put a new spirit in us sometimes he won't put things on your heart he put a new heart in you and he says just act it just act but what if I will give and God wouldn't be pleased well I can assure you generosity will never displease him 
What if I'm gonna fast on Wednesday and God won't be pleased? I can assure you, you will never displease Him by fasting. There's other things you can displease Him why, by, but choosing to honor God, even if you didn't hear God, but what if I give too much? When it leaves your hand, it doesn't leave your life. It will show up in your eternal account. You will never make a mistake. Somebody, I think Anne Frank said, nobody becomes poor by being generous. Amen. Parents don't get mad if their kids do their chores without being told. When it comes to purposing to give, I have three simple principles and these three P's I heard from uh, Pastor Andy Stanley and to follow. Number one is to make giving a priority. A priority. What's the difference between tithing and tipping is priority. For example, if you tip, it's after you've eaten. Tithing is before you spend your money. Many Christians, they don't tithe, they tip. Meaning they wait after the bills are paid. They wait when all of the stuff and then if we have enough, then we'll give to God, my friend. That is called tipping, not tithing. What makes tithing, what makes giving, giving is that it comes first. Meaning we honor God with it and we trust that God will bless the rest. Somebody say amen. amen. Number two is principle of giving is you give by percentage. Now Bible says a lot about number 10 and it's a good place to maybe start. Tithing was started 500 something years before the law. So tithing is not a law because it was to practice by people of faith like Abraham. But you don't have to start with 10. You can start with 20. You can start with 25. It, choose your percentage. One of the reasons why I love and we encourage to choose with percentages for this reason. If you do it spontaneously, it won't be consistent. But if you do it by a system, for example, none of us brush our teeth spontaneously. You're like, well, whenever I feel lead. Whenever I look in the mirror and I see a lot of dark on my teeth, yeah, that's my time to, to, to brush my teeth. None of us eat spontaneously. Now, a lot of us eat consistently and on the top of the spontaneously. <laughs> None of us sleep spontaneously. You're like, yeah, I don't feel like sleeping for the next three days. I won't be sleeping. There are systems we have in our life and these are good systems. On the top of those systems, we add spontaneity. Did I pronounce that word right? half right okay so on the top of the systems we add being spontaneous and that's how we have to live we have to create a system for our finances including the area of giving where it's a systematic and on the top of that you can flow with being being spontaneous as the spirit leads i like what uh, one millionaire read his book called rich dad poor dad i'm not sure he's a believer um, but this is what he said robert kiyosaki the reason we give is because tithing is our way of paying our partner. Now this is not a church person. Tithing is our way of paying our partner God. God is the best business partner I have ever had. He asks for only 10% and lets me keep the other 90. You know what happens when you stop paying your partners? They stop working for you. He said that's why I tithe. Doesn't go to church. But he tithes because he treats God as his partner. And he wants God to work with him. That's a, that's a very theological, theological statement. John Rockefeller, who's considered the richest American who ever lived. If you compare his wealth to the inflation, he's way more richer than Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates or Warren Buffett. And this is what he said. Yes, I tithe. And I would like to tell you how it all came about. I, I had to begin work as a small boy to help support my mother. My first wages were $1.50 per week. The first week after I went to work, I took my $1.50 home to my mother and she held the money in her lap and explained to me that she would be happy if I would give a tenth to the Lord. I did. And from that week until this day, I have tithed every dollar God had entrusted me. And I want to say, if I had not tithed the first dollar I made, I would not have tithed the first million dollars I made. And he says this in an interview. He says, tell your readers to train their children to tithe and they will grow up to be faithful stewards to the Lord. The wealthiest American that lived that the United States has had was a person who, and if you study a little bit his history, at one time while being a millionaire, he was a janitor in church. He was a Sunday school teacher. He served on the board. He was very involved in the local church. 
and he was a very faithful giver choose your percentage and the third p which you won't have it in the notes but we'll just give it to keep it progressive meaning when god blesses you increase that percentage many people in the room today they give over 20 percent and that's completely normal why because as god blesses you it shouldn't just increase our living it should also increase our giving can somebody say amen, amen. daniel purposed in his heart the scripture does not say that God came to Daniel and said, Daniel, don't eat this, don't eat that. Daniel just made things in his heart. He says, I choose in my own heart to do that. Christians, it's okay not to be led by the Lord to be generous. It's not because God is not speaking to you. It's in fact, God placed a heart inside of you that is already can be making right decisions. And you can be confident that God loves cheerful giver. Someone who's not motivated by necessity or grudgingly. Now, if grudgingly is the only way you obey God, may you be happily, may you be grudgingly happy. <laughs> may God bless your grudgingliness and feeling of necessity. Still obey the Lord. He will take it from the grudge as well, not just from the cheerful giver. The point of this message that I want to highlight is what happened to Daniel. The Bible says that Daniel decided to honor God in Babylon and not to eat from the delicacies of the king. Now first few things we must understand about Daniel is that most likely most theologians and historians would agree that Daniel was a eunuch. He was, um, his manhood was removed when he became a servant to the chief of eunuchs. It was prophesied to Hezekiah that his descendants will be eunuchs in the palace of Babylonian king. Now for most of us who read this you're like no big deal. It's a big deal. That means he would never be married. And he would never have children. Now on the top of that, Daniel's family most likely was wiped out in the conquest by Babylonians in Israel. Daniel, not only that, according to the Bible, the Bible says he whose testicles are crushed and whose male organ is cut off will never be able to enter the church of God. So think about this. Daniel can never enter God's temple now, can never have a family, cannot have children. His parents most likely were killed. He's in the new territory and guess who was responsible for all of that? Well it's God who prophesied that this will happen and Daniel in the midst of this difficult situation chooses without being led by God to be faithful to God when God will not even allow him to come into the assembly. God won't even allow him to come to the temple. Be faithful to the principles of God when he's in a different country. He's in a different territory. And this God has not been fair to Daniel. I want to speak to people today who feel like life has not been fair. You know what? God has not been fair. You can study God's character and you will see many things about God. He is just. He is merciful. He is good. He is forgiving. He will punish things to, up to four generations. But not one time in the Bible will you see that God is fair. Stop expecting God to be fair. He never said he was. Life is not fair. But God is good. He might not be fair. But he wants to give favor. The Bible says in the next verse is that God gave Daniel favor. Why? Because when you are faithful to God, when things are not fair, you qualify yourself for His favor. God's favor doesn't come to those who are educated. God's favor doesn't come to those who are talented. God's favor doesn't come to those who earn or deserve it. God's favor comes to those who remain faithful when they feel like God's not been fair. My mom and dad has not been fair. Life has not been fair. My boss has not been fair. The economy has not been fair. The president has not been fair. The governor has not been fair. My ex has not been fair. That person has not been fair. The court system has not been fair. My life has not been fair. And God is watching you and saying, will you be faithful when things are not fair? Because if you are, I have favor. I have favor. I have favor. Many people are only faithful when things are fair. 
They only tithe when things are fair. They only pray when life is fair. They're only in church when things are fair. God forbid unfairness hits them and because their faithfulness hinges on fairness. My friend, let your faithfulness hinge on God. Let your faithfulness to prayer, faithfulness to giving, faithfulness to fasting hinge on God's faithfulness, on God's goodness. My God, your faithfulness to God should not depend on the fairness of life. When I was a teenager, this what I just mentioned to you was very close to my heart because I felt I was dealt an unfair hand. Why was I born like this? What did I deserve? What did I do to God to cause me to be born like that? I felt that God wasn't fair with me. I felt like the world wasn't fair with me because I didn't have any special outstanding gifts that could make me feel significant. I felt that life wasn't fair. And the interesting part, God never answered my fairness quest. He never explained why. When you fight for fairness, you will always be met with God's silence. Do you know why God doesn't want you to win the fairness fight? Because once you win it and your neighbor gets favor, you will always say, I chose the wrong battle. God waited. I felt like he waited. He said, Vlad, if you only get over the unfairness, I'll meet you with favor. I'll give you things you didn't work for. I'll give you things you don't qualify for. You don't have education and connections for. I will give you favor. Just please step over the unfair and stay faithful when it's not fair. Stay prayerful when life is not fair. Stay generous when the economy is not fair. Stay faithful. Even if you feel like God treated you like he treated Daniel and it felt like you got emasculated. You got cut off from the temple and you don't have a future because they reduced his future. He's not able to get married and have children but he says, God, though you slay me, I will trust you. Little did he know, God was waiting on the other side. He says, fairness passed you by but favor won't pass you by. There is favor that exists for people who refuse to hinge their faithfulness to how life is, how people treated them. What has happened to you? Like Malika shared, when somebody took his identity, maybe somebody destroyed your credit score because you were married before and all of that person walked away and today you have to take years to rebuild that. Maybe there were things you were denied of and it's completely not your fault. Maybe you feel like somebody put a limit on your future. Maybe you feel like you got emasculated. Certain things were removed from you and you feel like you're trapped. I'm going to tell you one thing. You can be in prison. But if God's favor comes on you, there is no prison that can hold that. There is no prison that can hold that. God's favor still exists for your life. And God is asking you, will you be faithful? Well, life is not fair. Don't fight for fairness. Trust in God for His favor. The world fights for fairness. They'll take you to court so things are fair. They'll, they'll scream at you so things are fair. Christians, when there's a battle for, for fairness, walk away. It's a lesser battle. battle. It's a, it has an inferior victory. We trust in favor. If you look at people who walk in God's favor, almost every one of them, you will see this common denominator for all of them. They all had things that were unfair that happened to them and they refused to be offended. They refused to be broken by it and they refused to be defined by it. And they had this audacious faith to step over them and plunge into the unknown. And guess what met them on the other side? The loving hands of the very God they felt like was unfair to them. And he gave them something that they looked back they're like, praise God and life was never fair. Because God, you gave me something better. You gave me your grace. That's what Paul says in, the, in Corinthians. He says, God loves the cheerful giver. And he said that he will make all grace. What is grace? Unmerited favor. 
so God says when you begin to step in and be faithful to God when maybe your job has not been fair to you maybe the economy maybe you've been for low maybe you've been laid off maybe things have been challenging and you say God I'm gonna stay faithful to you listen there is all grace there is grace on the other side there is favor of God on the other side. I'm not saying you're going to be wealthy, healthy. I'm not saying dollars are going to come from heaven. But I'm saying something is going to mark your life that you cannot explain. You cannot get credit for. And other will notice that you are, they will say, lucky. You will say, no, highly favored. Man, things just work out for you. You're like, you have no idea what I had to go through. And it's not that I earned this quote unquote hashtag luck. No, it's just I seen God's favor. I refused to be offended when I felt mistreated, when I felt treated unfairly. I just stepped over it and I trusted there is a God who counts everything and He will settle the score. And if He doesn't give me fairness, I don't want fairness. I want His favor. Come on somebody. And that's what the Bible says is Daniel had things that were unfair happen to him. Daniel chose to be faithful to God's principles. He was already in a different land. Those rules didn't apply to him. He was already excommunicado. That's John Wick. <laughs> Excommunicated. <laughs> Excommunicated from the temple system. He was already gone from that system. He did not owe anything to God. Daniel honestly could live however he wanted to live now. Temple never accepted him anymore. He has no future according to the human perspective. And he says, I'm going to still be faithful. Little did he know is that the next verse God's favor will come. But I want to highlight something. Daniel did not just sacrifice his delicacies. He tested God for 10 days. For 10 days he took a test. And I find that very interesting because giving is the only place where God invites us to test him. In all other places you don't want to put God in the classroom and give him an exam. You don't want to do that. That's not in the rub room really well. Israel did it. God didn't take it really good. But tithing is the place. Giving is the place where God says, test me now in this. In Malachi chapter 3, it says the following. It says that, bring all the tithes into the storehouse of God that there might be food there. And then it says that, try me now in this. Daniel tries God for 10 days. You may say well he didn't try God he tried the chief eunuch not really because chief eunuch had nothing to do with the outcome of that it was God in heaven who gave him that favor how did he test God he says Lord I want to obey you but it's not easy I want to trust you but it's the odds are against me if you meet me after 10 days I will continue if you don't this is what Daniel said I'll go bad eat, go back eating these cheeseburgers <laughs> eating these tacos I'm gonna go back eating delicacies. He trusted in God. Tithing is the only place I believe each one of us should put God to a test. Tithing is the time where God is testing you and at the same time he is taking a test too. You're being tested and you may say man I just feel so tested. In the area of finances when you give God is also being tested. He puts himself into a test. I've seen God get a test he usually has really good grades he comes out good and when he does and you do both of you meet great things happen I'm gonna share just a few little just test results that's all that happened on June 21st some of you heard that story in the morning devotion before church as I was praying I felt that the Lord wanted me to felt prompted to give all of my content for free it was a necessity I didn't want to do it but I felt I needed to do it by Monday morning, 1,400, 1, 500 items already was downloaded. A week before that, I started a P.O. Box account for the ministry, Vladimir Subject Ministry. On Monday, I go into the P.O. Box. There's only one person that knew the P.O. Box number. Only one person in the world uh, who knew it outside of my wife. On Monday morning, I go in there. I just wanted to see the P.O. Box, that's all, because I didn't even see it. My wife started it. I open the P.O. Box, and in that P.O. Box is a check for $1,500. And in one day, 1,500 items gets downloaded for free out of my website. I held the check in post office and I cried. You know why? Because God passed the test. I wasn't testing God. I believe that He was testing me. Little did I know God was also taking the test. During that 21st of June, 
I felt in my heart God says when you're gonna give your content for free you're gonna be like Moses they will go to hurting people because most people who need the content you produce cannot afford it and I want you to give it to them for free the school and everything just give it for free and he says as you become Moses to Israel Aaron will become help to you he made it very clear to me he said I will send you partners I will talk to them you won't even ask them in a week or so people start becoming partners the crazy part is this last week my own brother because Aaron was Moses' brother. He is now the highest giver, supporter of my ministry. And it just blew me away that actually like what God said became true. My brother did not, you know, connect those dots at first. And when I connected, I was like, man, this is a fulfillment of that. What is that to me? It's not about money. To me, it's about seeing God take the test. After that, what took place, some of you knew I was, I'm releasing a third book. And I dreamed of for three years to have a publisher publish me instead of being self-published. It makes you more official when the publisher publishes. Usually they open more doors and if publisher wants you to write a book, they give you this thing called advance. Advance is when they give you money up front. And I have a publisher who was sitting there when I was preaching for Benny Hinn. And he came to me afterwards. He said, I want you to write this book. I wrote the book and the publisher offered me money a month ago. It was 5,000 US dollars. And I came to the Lord because I knew if I give the book to the publisher, I will never be able to give it for free. Yeah. And I said, Lord, what should I do? Because I want to offer stuff for free. And I really felt here in my heart, God says, it's your choice. He said, do you want to make money or do you want to make difference? I was like, God, come on, don't, don't, question, don't put questions like that. <laughs> Coming, of course, who's going to say in the right mind, yeah, I want to make money. <laughs> but I really felt the Lord says, it's whatever you want. And so I've wrestled for a week. Because here's a contract that could open doors for me for different TV shows and different stations and it could make me more official but I won't be able to give it to people who need it the most. And there is something that I want to do and I've seen God's faithfulness already. I've seen God take the test and I honestly decided in my own heart. I said I'll give it a shot. I wrote the publisher and I said I declined the offer. I will publish it myself because I want to offer it for free. And when I did that this morning an elderly couple from UK Jay and Jasmine sent $7,000 gift and it says we just want to send just to you and your wife we don't know why it's and it's more than what the publisher offered just a month ago God will pass your test now some of you may say you're bragging no I'm just showing you God's results I'm just showing you God will pass the test see giving is a test to your heart and it's also this is a test to God and God invites that God says test me now in this please don't be afraid to put God in a test give him six months 12 months if you've never tied it in your life if, or you were inconsistent you're like man this stuff it's just a, you know get rich quick gimmick you know it's just all those pastors they want the money and all of this stuff if you kind of believe in that put that all aside and says Lord if this is what your word says I want you to test my heart I want to be faithful and secondly God I'm testing you See if he's going to come out. And if he doesn't, stop tithing. Unless you stop it afterwards and say, Lord, you said it. You didn't come through. I don't believe in this. Test God. Daniel did. And God came through. I did. A numerous times. I've seen my parents. I've seen other people. The reason why I'm not ashamed to talk about it, even though it's a taboo topic in the church, is because, guys, this stuff, it honors God. And God, somehow, some way, this is what happens to us. What happened to Daniel? Ten days. Daniel decides to go on a diet of vegetables and water and after 10 days the Bible says and I want you to see the, what it says in the Bible it says at the end of the 10 days verse 15 at the end of their 10 days their features appeared better and fatter <laughs> see all of all of us people in, in the 21st century we got to get renewing our mind fatter is better my gosh <laughs> somebody say I'm already there praise the Lord <laughs> I was looking for a verse the Bible says after the 10 days now but look at the miracle of this you don't get fatter from vegetables and water what the miracle is is that for 10 days they eat vegetables and water and the Bible says they become fatter that's the miracle because fatter meaning you become a little bit plump you become bigger there's more but you're eating less see that's the principle of tithing is that you have less because you give but then somehow you become fatter I mean your account becomes better fatter 
your your job becomes fatter other things become bigger but you're like I can't explain it see Daniel put God through a test he says I'll eat vegetables and water and comes out fatter than people who eat Krispy Kreme Big Mac tacos on Tuesday gelatas on Wednesday and kartoshka on Thursday and they were I mean they were fatter because they kind of ate but Daniel looks because Daniel ate vegetables and water see tithing works like this it's when you get fatter out of vegetables and water it's you're supposed to have less but you have more I like what Robert Morris says is that 90% with God 90% with God's blessing is better than 100% without you know what John Bunyan said there man a man was there they called him mad the more he gave the more he had how do you explain that nobody can in book of Proverbs it says there is one who scatters yet increases more and there is one who withholds more than is right but it leads to poverty the generous soul will be made rich and he who waters others will be watered himself I don't know how that works I can't explain it this is not get rich quick scheme this is not give a hundred you can get a thousand this is not some kind of a Ponzi scheme but I just know one thing it worked for Daniel he ate vegetables and water he got fatter face and it works for us in tithing when we tithe it seems like we're living on 90 percent we should have less but at the end of the month you seem that there is all sufficiency in all things you can't explain it you just have to experience it can somebody say amen but not only Daniel's face got fatter his mind got better because I want you to see what it says in here verse 20 and in all matters of wisdom and understanding about the about which the king examined them he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in this realm let me ask you a question how many days did Daniel test God for? How many times was he found better? Ten times. Tithing is tenth. I believe when you test God through tithing, God wants to, not only he wants to bless your finances, but he wants to bless your mind. Because in here the Bible doesn't say that he got a welfare check. In here it does not say he won a lottery so many people have a very mixed view of how God blesses them they think God is going to rain money from heaven well if that would have been God's blessing then why does people who win lottery end up usually more poor suicidal and depressed money is not your solution God wants to increase your capacity for here God wants to give you connection with people and God wants to bless your work because if you only have money and you're watching Netflix and Amazon video that is not God's blessing God blessed him with wisdom not with wealth God blessed him with work not with welfare God wants to increase our capacity here God wants to bless your trading skills God wants to bless your sales skills God wants to bless your creativity whether you do somebody's hair or you do somebody's house whether you are building somebody's website or you are creating music or making art God wants to bless your work come on somebody he wants to increase our capacity because if only giving is not that I could do whatever I want with my 90% giving is not that oh God just gonna keep sending me checks that is not God's blessing my friend what I just shared with you these stories these are not God's blessings these are God's results of a test real God's blessing and when God helps me to write a book and it touches thousands of people real God's blessing is when I launch the school and the school impacts nations real God's blessing and when God anoints my voice and it will go to the 1040 window and it will touch the world and from there comes everything else my friend blessing is on your work blessing is on your wisdom blessing is on your creativity God will bless the work of your hands so my friend if you are sitting like this God's not gonna bless that God doesn't bless welfare checks he blesses work now there are people in this room you're on disability or you fell on a hard time I am not speaking to you I'm speaking to young strong people who are sitting on welfare and who are sitting on employment because it pays more my friend that's not God's blessing get off of the employment create something build something start something trade something learn something why because God wants to bless you with wisdom come on 
Come on, somebody. Because God wants to bless you with wisdom. Come on, somebody. Amen.